Hi, everyone. Welcome to Strongly Typed API Specification Extensions with Protobufs. My name is Robert. I work on Protobuf tooling at Buff. We got a short session today, so let's just get started. I think it's safe to say everyone at this conference would like to see freeform unspecified APIs disappear. Explicit API specification helps promote better API design, sets clear expectations, and helps you manage APIs over time. By virtue of being here today, I think we'll all agree that explicitly specified APIs have great benefits. However, as with any desired outcome, there are many paths to get there. Today, I'd like to explore something that might seem like a small difference between protocol buffers and open API ways of specifying APIs. It is a small difference in the sense that there are many larger contrasts between these two approaches. But I think it's a great example of how the different design decisions taken by both work out in practice. The feature is extensibility. The rest of this talk will briefly look at extensions in Protobuf and OpenAPI. We'll dive into some applications of extensions in Protobuf and end with a little bit of reflection. First up, extensibility in OpenAPI. Somewhat towards the end of the specification, you'll find section 4.9 on extensibility. This is the whole section, so let's look briefly at a few things mentioned here. The first thing that I would like to call out is that the open API specification says that you're trying to accommodate most use cases. And this is certainly true. To get here in the spec, you can pass data schemas, rest paths, error codes, authentication, and much, much more. It's a stated goal here that they want the uh, specification to be monolithic and encompass as much as possible, but they also provide an escape hatch for when it doesn't fit. The other interesting part to highlight here is that they explicitly say that the extensions may or may not be supported by available tooling. And this may seem obvious, as clearly generic open API tooling cannot interpret concrete extensions that were designed outside the scope of the specification. However, in the context of open API, there is some more tooling to worry about, especially the tooling related to authoring specs. Barely anyone writes for both open API by hand. And considering that the type of the uh, extensions here is designated as an any, which means that they can basically look like anything. It means that authoring tools usually have subpar support for extensions because they generally have nothing to, um, to hook on. Now, let's look at how extensions are specified in protobuf APIs. Important to note here is that Protobuf is a name for a larger tool chain. Throughout the rest of this talk, I'll be primarily referring to the language when you find that you find in protofiles when mentioning Protobuf, rather than the other forms you might know it, like the binary encoding of Protobuf messages. First up, a quick refresher on Protobuf. The proto language is pretty small and has a few key primitives. Messages and enums are ways to describe the schema of data. Concrete messages are encoded using the proto binary encoding or as JSON. In addition to messages and enums, services are proto's way of specifying how messages should be exchanged. They are the API specification. Groups of methods that take a request message and will return you a response message. Today, this is mostly used in the context of the gRPC framework. Now for extensions, Protobuf lets you declare options for any part of the Protobuf specification in a Protobuf file. The way this works under the hood is pretty neat, but we'll have to skip over that for the purposes of time, unfortunately. And we're going with a few examples instead. So here you can see a Protobuf annotation for fields, and we have called this annotation my annotation, and it's a boolean. You can see there in the second example that we set this annotation to true on this particular field. And to note there in the bottom is that when we set it to something that's not a Boolean, the protobuf compiler will warn us. This is particularly useful because this also works for complex events or for complex annotations, because not everything has to be a bool. It can also be a message, for example. So let's see a few of these in action. As first example, protobuf, the language does not have any built way in built in way to express extra constraints on messages for validation. However, this is perfectly achievable with annotations on fields. 
a popular OSS implementation of validation is Proto-CGen Validate, an offshoot of the Envoy project that has validators for quite a few popular language and a wide expressive set of constraints that you can add to your protobuf messages. Another common application of annotations is the HTTP gRPC mapping. When a service author designs their protobuf APIs with RESTful semantics in mind, they can get a free HTTP API by adding in a couple of annotations. There are multiple proxies that understand these annotations, and they will expose HTTP endpoints that will internally rewrite the incoming requests and forward them to your existing gRPC services. These proxies are production ready, widely used, and are serving large amount of uh, API traffic today. Now for our next example, let's look at something that a company might do with internally defined extensions rather than a widely available project. Say some legislative body comes up with a requirement to treat certain data flowing through your system with special care. With a protobuf schema extension, you can capture this requirement with an option. Now, your engineering team can build on the single source of truth, for example, by making sure a logger in the middleware will always emit certain kind of values conforming to the requirements, or by making sure certain debugging flows will always detach or attach specific fields for traces for auditing or other purposes you might have. For the final example, I'd like to highlight that even though protobuf and gRPC are often grouped together, especially in the context of APIs, protobufs have existed without gRPC for a long time. The service method construct has always been part of the language. Before gRPC, there were just various smaller frameworks you could use with them with. This reinforces a point made before that in the context of the protobuf language, services are about the exchange of messages. It is the cogen, over the API definitions that maps that exchange of messages to a specific protocol. gRPC is just a common standard, but there are alternatives like twerk, for example. So when your organization evolves and you find that you have a need to move beyond RPC APIs, you could express that with protobuf annotations and writing a new code generator to tap into that pups of architecture that you just designed. This flexibility allows you to keep most of your existing processes and tools intact, and you can reuse your schemas throughout the stack. There is no need for a new standard or for new tools in your toolbox. Now, we have glossed over a lot, including how to interpret and actually use these options in practice. If you're interested, we're hosting a Birds of a Feather session later at this conference, and we'd love to see you there. As you've seen in some of these examples, extensions can be quite flexible and applied to many use cases. They'll let us keep the core API specification of the language nimble, while also being flexible and adaptable to the API author's ever-changing need. Protobuf's decision to treat APIs as code with a human-readable DSL makes it composable and amenable to a great extension authoring workflow. It also makes Protobuf an excellent citizen to integrate into your setup, as you can use the same tools and workflows that you use to author, review, standardize, and audit your regular code practices, but then for APIs. I hope that this way of looking at Protobuf puts the technology in a new light. Above, we're definitely excited about it, and we hope you are too. If you are, please come and find us sometime during this conference, and we'd love to have a chat. For now, have a great day. Hey there. Um, so that should be the end of the recorded talk. Um, I'm around for anyone who has some questions. I'll be monitoring the chat for the Q&A. Um, so please let us know if you want to chat about anything. So we have a question from Zane Starr that says, missed the part where you mentioned being able to convert to specific types. Could you clarify on that question a little bit, Zane? I'm not sure how to interpret the specific types thing here. Ah, right. So 
um, your JavaScript does not have a way of representing uh, like 128 bit integer. I don't think out at the top of my head that protobuf actually has a way to define a 128 bit integer off the top of my head. Um, there is a set of well-known types um, which allow you to, or like it, it's basically common protobuf messages that you'll see reused throughout um, the ecosystem. And I think the 120 bit uh, integer in there is actually two 64 bit integers where you have the lower or the most significant bits in one and the least significant bits in the other one. Um, so that's generally how you would deal with that. Um, let's see. A 64 bit integer where JavaScript is restricted to a lower set. Um, in general, this would be something where the parser for a language that takes your protobuf messages and tries to encode them in your data specific objects, um, it's the, the code that will convert that usually the code generator that you write will take care of that. Um, pretty similar to a way where if you have a JSON object with, I guess, something that does is not representable in the actual underlying type, you would error out there. Um, I think you would be able to use annotations to say on the wire, I have this specific type um, and I want to convert that in my uh, code generator into something different. Um, there is a, a project for Golang called GoGoProto, which did something like this, where you could specify um, types on your uh, like application level types for the things on the wire that you would find. Um, and then those would be converted. Uh, another question here is, do annotations go across the wire? Uh, the answer is they do not. They're part of the schema specification um, and they do not get embedded in messages. Looks good. Um, let's see if there's any questions in the Q&A tab because I haven't looked there. I don't think so. Cool. I think if there's no more questions, then we can loop this session to an end. Thanks everyone for coming.